Okay, thank you. We're going to get started. Um, uh, two of our speakers are uh, needing to make sure they are on the road by 425. <laughs> and so we want to make sure we get started on time and, and leave time for the discussion. Um, so thank you so much for, for staying to the final session. And I, I'm really looking forward to this last session. Um, it is, is focusing really on where we need to go from here. Uh, as you know, obviously the, the original panel book was published in 1996, and, and now 20 years later we're here. And so this, this last session is really focusing on where, where should we go 20, sec, uh, 20 years into the future. Um, and really trying to look forward. We tasked our panel members with really trying to think about what are the, the methodological issues that we should be focusing on moving forward, what are the application issues, and really how can we move to make sure that, um, that cost access analysis is best impacting patients and providers and policymakers moving forward. And so we have some really great perspectives here. And, um, and I think we'll enjoy hearing from them and having some time for discussion. So Dr. Michael McGinnis is a senior scholar and the executive officer of the National Academy of Medicine. He's um, also the executive director of its leadership consortium for a value and science driven health system. And prior to his work in the academies, he was the senior vice president at the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. And then um, for almost 20 years, Dr. McGinnis held policy um, responsibility for prevention programs within the Department of Health and Human Services. We then also have uh, Dr. Milt Weinstein, Weinstein, who is a professor of health policy and management and medicine at Harvard Medical School. He co-chaired the original panel on cost factors in health and medicine. And he was the co-developer of the coronary heart disease policy model, as well as the CPAC simulation model. He's, um, in addition to the, the original panel book, uh, co-author on books on decision making and health and medicine and clinical decision analysis and he's also received career achievement awards both from the Society of Medical Decision Making and the Lifetime Achievement Award from ISPOR. Uh, Dr. Martha Gold is a senior scholar in residence at the New York Academy of Medicine. She's also a senior policy advisor in the office of the assistant or was a senior policy advisor in the office of the assistant secretary for the Department of Health and Human Services in the, in the 1990s where her focus was on the economics of medical care and health led to her work in directing the, um, the original panel on cost factors in health and medicine. Um, she chaired the IOM Committee on Public Health Strategies to Improve Health. She's a member of the National Academy of Medicine and its roundtable on population health. And then finally, we'll have Dr. Mark McClellan, who's a professor of business and medicine and health policy at Duke, where he also directs Duke's new center, uh, Margola Center for Health Policy. He's a former administrator of the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services and the former commissioner of the FDA. Um, he was a member of the President's Council of Economic Advisors. He was a senior fellow at the Brookings Institute as, as well as professor of economics and medicine at, at Stanford University. So um, I'm going to turn it over to our panelists. They're all going to speak for about five to six minutes each and then allow some time for discussion at the end. Well, thank you very much, uh, Jillian, <clears throat> and thanks to you and uh, <clears throat> Peter and Ted and Louise and my fellow uh, panel members uh, for uh, putting things uh, together. This is really uh, an exciting and wonderful um, opportunity for me uh, to uh, not only uh, <clears throat> share some comments, but especially uh, to give uh, congratulations and thanks to the members of the second panel for the really sterling job uh, that uh, each of you has done. And I know that there are a lot of other folks uh, in the audience who have been part of it uh, who are not on the panel uh, itself uh, and who have provided uh, important guidance along the way. So uh, heartfelt thanks uh, uh, and congratulations, uh, congratulations on that count. And especially, uh, it gives me the um, wonderful opportunity to express my enduring gratitude uh, to the members of the first panel uh, and its co-chairs uh, who are here in the room uh, for the uh, uh, stunning uh, job that they did uh, creating uh, a, a design in many ways uh, out, of, uh, out of whole cloth. Uh, and 
the legacy that they have left and continue to lay down uh, is really very impressive, and I'm personally very grateful uh, for that. Uh, I think I'm, my job is uh, primarily to give the historic perspective, uh, and I'm happy to do that and maybe take a little glimpse into the future. It's always helpful, I think, uh, uh, when you're looking ahead to pause for a moment uh, to look back. Uh, and uh, looking back to the first panel, uh, there were primarily, uh, when it comes right down to it, uh, two reasons uh, for the uh, first panel. Uh, actually, there was an a priori reason that I should uh, state in advance. And that a priori reason uh, is that the panel was launched um, primarily because of the vision um, uh, and leadership of the members of the second U.S. Preventive Services Task Force. I don't know if you've gotten into that at all uh, in the course of the meeting here, uh, since I haven't been able to attend. Uh, that was the, that uh, task force was chaired by Hal Sox, and uh, I think uh, Don Burke was the vice chair, and there are some folks here uh, who were participants in that activity. But in the course of their work, not surprisingly, uh, given the vision of these folks and who they are, um, they felt that it really um, wouldn't be responsible uh, for the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force to issue recommendations about what kinds of services ought to be delivered if there wasn't some consideration given uh, to the economic implications of what their recommendations were. And uh, I have to say, uh, they had in me, in conversations uh, with them about this, a very receptive audience, because most of my career has been devoted not only to prevention, uh, but to the fundamental notion of the rational allocation of social resources. So it clearly makes a lot of sense. On the other hand, it was also clear um, that uh, two things were very clear. Uh, one is that that was going to be uh, introducing a distraction uh, from the science because you all know uh, what people pay attention to uh, when there are dollars and cents involved. Uh, and the task force was charged with a vitally important mission <clears throat> of building the science base uh, for uh, assessment of uh, clinical preventive services and thereby making the case airtight uh, for why preventive services, clinical preventive services were so important. And it, we didn't really want a distraction in that case. The other issue, though, was the fact that the methodology uh, for cost-effectiveness analysis was in many ways uh, still developing from a variety of very different perspectives. Uh, so um, the alternative uh, that uh, I suggested was stick to the science base and we'll take on the issue of the economic implications in a different fashion, one that will help build the field, like you're building the field of uh, uh, marshalling the evidence space uh, from the scientific perspective, one, one that will help build the field of cost-effectiveness analysis. And so, in effect, um, I turned to Martha Gold, who was uh, in, in our office then, and said, make this happen, and she did. <laughs> she recruited a great panel. Uh, and uh, did great work. Uh, they're, back to their two charges, they were pretty straightforward. Um, essentially, um, their charges were to um, try to bring methodologic uh, rationale and consistency to the field, give it a, a set of hooks uh, that make sense from the field perspective that the field can build on. And secondly, uh, address the issue of how it can be used, get it used. And um, that brings me then to the question of looking back, um, because they did such a fabulous job. Uh, what is the status now with respect to those two charges? Methodologic advancement uh, and consistency and the use of, uh, of cost-effectiveness analysis. On the uh, first charge, it seems to me, you guys are the experts, and I'd love to hear uh, more, but uh, we've had substantial progress. The contribution to the first panel was really pioneering in that respect. 
Uh, it's been referred to thousands of times. It is the touchstone reference point uh, for uh, cost effectiveness analysis um, uh, around, uh, around the world and uh, has set the stage uh, for this further advancement uh, that is very future oriented, which I'll come back to in a second. With respect to the second uh, charge, increase the use of cost effectiveness analysis or set the stage for uh, increasing the use uh, in, uh, uh, in social decision making, uh, the track record is a little more mixed. Uh, there are some places where it's used, uh, other places it's not. Uh, so it's kind of a wait and see uh, what might happen in the future. Which brings me to the issue of looking ahead, which I'll use my last minute on. Uh, <clears throat> what might we anticipate, um, given the great contributions of the first panel to uh, derive from the second panel's uh, also great contributions? Uh, with respect to the second piece, the use of cost effectiveness analysis, um, the contribution of the uh, panel uh, has been, I think, very uh, uh, important in beginning to look at the practical applications. Who are the stakeholders? Who are, what are the perspectives that are going to be at play when use uh, is required? And the, be, the beginning to stratify and pay attention to what implications are for those different users, I think is a very important advance. So um, the, the notion of perspectives has added a great deal of practicality to it. In addition, if you just look at the need uh, for cost effectiveness analysis or what we would assume is the need uh, uh, amidst a context in which uh, the economic pressures uh, have never been greater, they're going to continue to grow, uh, in which uh, that growth trajectory is going to be uh, is going to be driven by the developments in precision medicine uh, with increasing numbers of interventions that are going to have to be assessed, are going to drive, potentially drive costs and have to be assessed. Uh, and with the um, uh, need to, we hope, uh, we'll see what the uh, new directions are with respect to financing. Mark will talk about this. With the need to um, begin, uh, continue the move toward value based payments and ultimately toward population-based uh, payments, uh, there is clearly going to be a need to account for the other determinants of health uh, uh, in these uh, calculations. So I think that uh, the uh, society is well poised to make better use uh, of cost-effectiveness analysis as a result of the work of the, of the panel. Back on the first piece, the methodologic um, advances, uh, it's a little more, uh, it, 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 the notion's cut in two directions. With the additional granularity uh, that's anticipated, um, it's a more complex issue, uh, a more complex set of challenges. On the other hand, uh, i just wrap up by underscoring again the practical guidance that the panel has built in uh, to the recommendations uh, on the methodologic front. The notion of uh, providing abstract guidelines, which helps people uh, at the outset begin to think of how they uh, uh, can uh, uh, shape the way that the methodologies are used. The notion of disaggregating um, the uh, outcomes that are reported, also uh, important guidance uh, uh, that will uh, advance the practicality of the application methodology, and finally, the development of a very interesting impact template, uh, uh, another practical tool. So I'm, uh, I'm come back where I started, uh, very grateful uh, uh, to the first panel, uh, even more grateful now to the second panel with what I see as a great potential for forward motion. And thanks again for the opportunity to be here. I can't tell you enough how gratified I am to, uh, to be here, to see the, the legacy continuing. The second panel has carried on the work of the first. Um, the panel brought uh, into the next millennium uh, some topics that uh, we just started to address. Uh, 
got to yes in our consensus in some areas that we kicked down the road, and that was good to see. But yet there are still some unsolved uh, issues, and I, I was asked to comment on some of those. Um, the one that, that I want to start with uh, is uh, the, 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 what's been called the threshold issue. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm the first to say we don't have thresholds in the United States, and we probably never will. So we shouldn't obsess about what the threshold should be. That said, the most frequently asked question I get uh, is, so how do I interpret this ICER, this incremental cost effectiveness ratio? Uh, you know, what do I compare it to? Uh, so I think we have to think about thresholds if only to interpret the results of a cost effectiveness analysis. Um, and, you know, in a discussion section, we often say, well, it's more cost effective than this, and it's less cost effective than that, and that sort of helps. But now I think the threshold problem, the interpretation problem, has gotten more difficult because of what I think was a very wise decision by the panel to introduce a healthcare perspective in addition to a societal perspective. Now, the panel changed a bit, or maybe a lot, what the original panel thought the societal perspective was and created a new, perhaps broader societal perspective. But then it sort of backed off from what the original panel called the societal perspective to, call, to create something called a healthcare perspective, which excludes, among other things, informal healthcare costs. So the question is, if whatever it is, $100,000 per quality, $150,000 per quality, was a reasonable reference point in the previous regime, what is or are appropriate reference points under the new regime? Now, surely, the way you th I, I'm saying that I'm overstating it, but not really. Surely, the reference point for an analysis from the healthcare perspective is different from a societal perspective, certainly the broad societal perspective defined by the panel. Now, in the example that Murray presented, the results were dominant under either perspective, and yet there were some pretty big differences in the delta costs. And if the, de if the denominator had been a little bit different, you might have had ICERs that varied all over the place, depending on which perspective you had. Um, and so I think we need, this is, a, I'd say this is an unsolved issue. I have thoughts about it, but I'm not going to bore you with my thoughts. Maybe that's another time. But I think this is an, address, this is an issue that needs to be addressed. Another sort of sub-comment is I don't, I think there's a danger to, to equate the healthcare perspective with a payer perspective. I know the panel was very careful not to use the term payer perspective. Uh, and, and, but it, they're very different, and I think somebody, I can't, I'm sorry, I don't remember who it was, pointed out that payers, particular payers, don't care about all health care costs, even formal health care costs. They care about the cost that they pay. So unlike Britain, where you have a single payer and they basically pay for everything, we have insurance, we have payers and people flit in and out, there's a lot of churn in the private sector, and then people go on Medicare, uh, and they may be Medicare Advantage, or they may be, uh, you know, have supplemental coverage to basic Medicare. Um, it's not the same as what, what the panel has called the healthcare perspective, which further uh, complicates the threshold question. So from a, a real payer perspective, like NICE, it's possible, at least in theory, and I know the York folks have tried to do this, actually to infer what the opportunity cost of resources is, and maybe that should be the threshold. But you can't do that in this country um, for the healthcare perspective. You might be able to do it for a payer, but the payer perspective isn't the healthcare perspective. So how do we think about thresholds? That's big issue number one. I use most of my time because I think that's the one that just uh, uh, keeps uh, keeps bothering. I mean, you, you know, the the first panel had a had a societal perspective, and now we've got two different perspectives. Neither one of which is exactly the same as what the original panel called the societal perspective. Um, the rest of what I'm going to say, other people have already said. That's, I guess, an advantage of being last, because you don't have to say as much, because people have already said it. So the issue of spillovers, I think, is an unsolved question. You know, how do you deal with the fact that 
my utility and my wife's utility are inextricably linked. Uh, and you don't want to count both utility improvements and add them, right? You know, if I get sick and my wife's utility goes down, my utility goes down, those aren't sort of independent or are they? And how do you deal with that? Um, and same, of, and uh, so, so that's one issue. Another issue that has been brought up is uh, there are gaps in our ability to uh, uh, value health outcomes in certain populations, children, the mentally incompetent, uh, and others, uh, you know, people with dementia and so on. Uh, and uh, I don't know that these are necessarily solvable problems, but they remain problems. And maybe in the next 20 years, uh, there will be progress in, in those domains. Uh, I was also asked to comment on uh, areas of application that uh, maybe we could see more of in the next 20 years. And you know, they're related to these last two things I've mentioned, spillovers and uh, utilities in special populations, and also the issue of the broader concept of societal costs, including non-health sector costs. So mental health, I mean, cost effectiveness in mental health, you don't see a lot done, because it's hard, because we don't know how to deal with getting utilities for people who are mentally uh, uh, unable to assess utilities, and children. And uh, there's a lot of great work going on in these special populations, uh, but the problem isn't solved. And there's plenty of work for people like Lisa who work on children's uh, um, uh, health to, uh, to make more progress on that. Um, so that's, that's really all, all I want to say. I think, you know, in this country, we're not going to have nice. I don't think uh, we probably moved a step farther away from nice in the last uh, month or two. Uh, but uh, we probably are going to see increasing use of incentives, both on the demand side through various forms of value-based insurance and on the supply side through various forms of value-based payment. And, uh, you know, whether the, you know, what's started to happen under the Affordable, Affordable Care Act will continue. I, 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 I don't know. I don't really know much about what's going to happen, but uh, I think we can all speculate. But I think it's going to have to happen through incentives. And uh, we'll see what happens. Thank you very much. So uh, like Michael and Milt, it's sort of wonderful to be here and see the next iteration of uh, the cost effectiveness of health and medicine. Um, I wanted to m mention um, that a person who is missing here today, who was really part of the quad quadrumvirate, that's a sort of hard, difficult word to say, is Joanna Siegel. Sorry she was not able to join us today, but she has been uh, was certainly critical in the first version and has been critical in the second version, and uh, so I miss her absence today. So um, when I uh, first got uh, drafted by Michael into this project, uh, I got very optimistic. I thought, you know, once we kind of standardize the methodology of cost effectiveness analysis, things would be value-based, there would be equity everywhere, and the sun would always be shining. And of course, it was a rather rude awakening when that did not actually happen. Um, and I, um, I became interested in how, in England, uh, people were able to have conversations about cost-effectiveness analysis. So during a, a sabbatical in 2003, I went over and sort of saw how they talked to members of the public about uh, resource allocation. So one of the questions that we were asked to consider is how is CEA going to impact patients, providers, policymakers moving forward? And for me, there's a very absent P here, and that is the public. If regular people don't become attuned to value for money as it relates to health, we're going to have an extraordinarily hard time changing policies and practices that are too frequently shaped by the medical industrial complex whose objectives often do not align with the greater public's interests. The US provider and policy community has been loath to suggest too strongly to the public that some things in medicine are not worth doing. There is too, too little value for the health benefits they confer. And often, therefore, patient preferences are often out of touch without me with medical benefit. Providers, insurers, and policymakers fear being accused of rationing or, as it is more wisely and appropriately termed in other parts of the world, priority setting. And we need to set priorities. 
As the second panel notes in their detailed new look at CEA practice and methods, the opportunity costs of healthcare have crowded out other non-health sector investments. Many of these investments in housing, in education, in fair wages, in safe environments, and communities confer health in addition to other benefits that contribute to individual as well as national vitality and strength. In terms of improvements in life expectancy and overcoming the substantial inequities faced between advantaged and less advantaged populations, many studies have shown that healthcare's impact on population health is dwarfed by social and environmental factors. How cost effective are interventions outside of healthcare? Dave Chosky and Tom Farley in 2012 did a review of the CEA uh, included in the Tufts Registry and found that environmentally focused non-clinical interventions were typically far more cost effective than individually directed clinical interventions. And yet there is a paucity of these type of CEAs in the literature. Peter Newman, myself, and colleagues have recently reviewed CEAs that looked at Healthy People 2020 objectives. Glancingly few of them took on broader social and environmental determinants, and even fewer compared them to inefficient healthcare technologies. So the public, and perhaps the healthcare system as well, lacks sufficient awareness of the impact of these factors on their health. Accordingly, I'd be looking for more cost-effectiveness analyses that are directed at interventions where health is but one of the outcomes. And the results should be disseminated and become a part of regular public discourse. Until we change public understanding of the forces that shape health, conversations about where we should place public and private dollars will continue to favor medical care at the cost of other investments. So the answer to the second question we were posed of important application issues that haven't been tackled by CEA recommendations and should be focused moving forward would be this. I hope to see cost effectiveness studies that focus on interventions whose benefits confer salutary effects that include but go beyond what can be obtained from medical care alone. These studies will often originate from teams working outside the traditional health and healthcare sector. This will require transdisciplinary work that health economists, methodologists, and practitioners develop or simply participate in. Among the recommendations of the 2012 consensus report from the Institute of Medicine, Investing in a Healthier Future, was one that called on Congress to direct the Department of Health and Human Services to develop a research infrastructure for establishing the effectiveness and value of public health and prevention strategies, and to study the health and economic outcomes associated with broader investments. The methodologic challenges of conducting these types of primordial prevention studies are real, but absent serious investment in evaluating broad-based interventions, we will continue to look under the lamppost for our keys. The final question we were posed, what important methodologic issues do you feel haven't been tackled by the new CEA recommendations and should be an area of focus moving forward? The second panel has put together an extraordinarily rich and thoughtful look at CEA methods, and so many important things have come up today, but I've written these comments, so I'm staying here. One of their key contributions is the use of the impact inventory for filling in the fullest implications of the costs and benefits when taking the societal perspective. While this makes good use of qualitative and some quantitative information, I'd like to see further work on methods that incorporate costs and benefits in a more consistent way into a CEA. I'd also like to see gains made in incorporating equity concerns more directly into economic analyses. A placeholder for noting them within the impact inventory would be welcome. I didn't see that listed there. As to the second panel's rationale for adding the healthcare perspective to the reference case, well, I understand it because as Willie Sutton allegedly gave us his reason to rob banks is that's where the money is. But I worry that this recommendation will result in many analyses foregoing the societal perspective, thereby arresting forward motion and solving some of its very many challenges. But I do have a wish for the healthcare perspective reference case. Modalities for treating chronic illness keep growing, and harmonizing an approach to health related quality of life within the healthcare reference case remains important. The first panel skirted endorsing a uniform catalog of weights, but at an ISPOR meeting some years ago with the developers of most of the major health-related quality of life instruments present, it really looked like we could get a consensus as to a placeholder measure that could improve comparability. 
Perhaps items from the NIH developed PROMISE measure, which has a great deal of clinical buy-in, and where investigators are now working to develop summary scores will help us to fill in that gap. What else is on my wish list for the 2036 version of cost effectiveness in health and medicine? First, ongoing work in creating tools that make the societal perspective the dominant one for the reference case, including a systematic way to consider the non-health related costs and benefits. Second, in the best of all possible worlds, I'd like to see a summary measure of quality of well-being in the denominator of a CE ratio. With all deference to Bob Kaplan and his colleagues, not the measure that currently carries that name, but one that lives outside of the skin as well and sees health the way the World Health Organization envisioned it as a state of physical, mental, and social well-being. Creating a measure of that nature will be challenging, but returning to where I began, Meaningful measures have uses outside of the scientific community. Sometimes they serve to pinpoint what a society thinks is important and assist the public and its policymakers in understanding what's really going on. Thank you. Well, there's uh, certainly some uh, good sides and bad sides of being the last speaker at the last session of such a distinguished event. It is a real privilege to be part of such a uh, broad-based effort that has so much to show for it. Uh, not only the, uh, the first uh, panel, uh, but uh, the, the, the breadth and depth of recommendations that came out of the second panel. Uh, on the other hand, I'm going to struggle a little bit to try to tell you something that you haven't heard. I'm going to focus not on that full set of questions that uh, Jillian posed for the uh, session, but on the uh, looking ahead at the potential impact of the work that this group has done, uh, building on the, the shoulders of the, the first report, and I'm talk some about the policy context. Uh, hopefully, uh, this important work will have an even greater impact than the first report did, which has been substantial. Uh, as you all have heard from most of the speakers, a lot has changed since that first report in 1993, both in terms of the capabilities and understanding of cost effectiveness uh, methods, as well as the context in which they're being used. There have been a lot of technologies and practices that have been developed and adopted since that time that have had their benefit, have had benefits significantly greater than cost and have been demonstrated so uh, using uh, solid CEA approaches. Uh, in some cases, uh, these are approaches to care that have had significant additions to our overall health care costs, but they've been adopted nonetheless, uh, thanks to the uh, foundations of CEA that this effort helped to, to, to lay. Uh, at the same time, though, uh, if you look at the big picture from a policy context, uh, boy, we still have a long way to go. Uh, health care spending has risen a lot from around 13 percent back at the time of that first report to 18 percent today, so the concerns about using resources effectively are all that much larger uh, and uh, going to get even bigger uh, in the future. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, the evidence continues to show, including a lot of evidence that continues to be developed by people right here in this room and the National Academy of Medicine, high rates of inefficient care, high uh, 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 persistent problems in, in uh, inequitable care, and persistent problems in the delivery of consistently high value care. So uh, we've got good methods, they're getting better, but we still have a ways to go. Uh, I think some of the new steps that the second panel has taken is going to help make the future brighter from the standpoint of an impact uh, of uh, good cost effectiveness analysis uh, on addressing some of these persistent uh, and fundamental challenges in our healthcare system and around the world. Uh, the new topics like evidence synthesis and decision modeling and uncertainty analysis. Uh, Milt already talked about the discussion of thresholds and the, the, the role of thresholds in helping to separate issues about uh, how to allocate the resources we have, to thinking about uh, what the level of resources devoted should be. Uh, all of this has been a huge amount of work in the uh, second panel, and uh, I'd just like to add my thanks to, to Jillian and uh, Peter and all the rest of the uh, contributors to this uh, very important report. But why not more of a policy impact yet? And the challenge for all of us is how do we increase that in the future? 
Well, maybe it's because the uh, existing resident recommendations dating back to 1993 haven't been followed as widely as they could be, uh, despite, for example, that emphasis in the first report on taking a societal perspective for the reference case. Uh, the, this report noted that most, more than 70% of the cost effectiveness analyses that have been performed since then have taken a narrower perspective. And in many cases, the CEAs that, that claim to be taking a broad perspective left out very important elements of effectiveness or cost impacts. Uh, for example, even within the health system perspective, it's important to include out-of-pocket payments and total cost uh, and future related and unrelated costs. So there's some gaps in applying the methodologies, and I think it's, uh, it's on us to, to try to take steps uh, to help uh, uh, close those gaps. Um, that said, I think there's a very good framework here for, for building out uh, a bigger impact in the future. I particularly appreciate the attention to the impact inventory, and Martha, Marcia mentioned this as well, uh, as it can provide a framework, a, sort of a checklist to make sure the important health and non-health impacts are not omitted when a cost-effectiveness analysis is performed. Uh, with this broader reach, uh, for example, to uh, uh, clinicians, and patients who are making treatment decisions and uh, uh, clini uh, clinical researchers, others could potentially use this kind of imp impact framework as well to help develop the evidence needed uh, and the practical tools that can accompany a formal cost effectiveness analysis to increase that potential impact. Uh, in other words, this impact inventory could be a very valuable unifying tool for the field. I came from an FDA meeting uh, earlier today that was focused on patient uh, that was uh, uh, I mean, that was focused on patient focused uh, drug development. Sorry, it's late in the afternoon. I'm saying focused uh, too often, uh, but uh, it's a very serious topic, one that has gotten attention in bipartisan legislation that's passing, uh, that's in the process of being enacted by Congress right. Right now, uh, the focus there is on making sure that the dimensions that are evaluated when drugs come to market and they continue to be evaluated when drugs are on the market are the ones that matter most to patients. And you heard earlier on this panel, um, we don't necessarily have a good system for approaching that, uh, uh, approaching that now. Uh, there are, however, I think some good opportunities coming uh, for improving that, uh, including, uh, uh, including uh, uh, new measures for conditions like schizophrenia, uh, mental illnesses, uh, other areas where the application of cost effectiveness analysis in the past has perhaps been more problematic. And there certainly is a huge amount of interest from patients with particular clinical problems, the, the regulators and product developers who are involved with them in filling out something like uh, these impact inventories uh, for medical products that come to market and then uh, uh, increasingly using the, the evidence that's available in the post-market context to fill out these inventories even further. So hopefully the leaders in these related fields can help create the stronger expectation that, that we should reinforce, the culture that we should reinforce, that uh, a cost-effectiveness analysis should follow sound principles like those outlined uh, in this panel. That is not the case today and hopefully will be uh, in the years ahead, but I do think we have some more work to do to get there. Now, it's not to say that cost-effectiveness analysis is having no impact. We've heard uh, during the course of the day today, even on the, the panel earlier, lots of examples uh, where CEAs are being used. Uh, I guess the ones that are most prominent are outside the U.S. Uh, NICE keeps getting mentioned, other regulatory and payment authorities that use cost-effectiveness analysis and decision tools based on them for uh, explicit coverage decisions about certain drugs and other technologies. But it's important to keep in mind that those countries are like the U.S. in other respects. Uh, even though we don't have a, a NICE, uh, around the world, these problems of persistent variations in uh, uh, quality of care, uh, inefficiencies in care, uh, inequities in care, uh, those are global issues. Uh, maybe you have more prominent versions of some, in some dimensions in this country, uh, but they, they certainly haven't been addressed uh, and uh, fully addressed in other areas either. And that's, that's where I'd like to, to highlight 
highlight a potential way of expanding uh, the use of cost effectiveness analysis that is very much in line with where I think some of the policy reforms in the United States uh, and other countries are headed. Uh, and that is, as uh, uh, Mike mentioned at the outset, the uh, trend towards payment models that are increasingly moving away from fee-for-service in this country or from fixed budgets for certain kind of silos of care in other countries uh, to payment systems that are more aligned with uh, results and performance and accountability at the patient and population level. Uh, this is not an accident. I think it's not even driven primarily by concerns about rising costs of care. Uh, I think it's really being driven concern by concerns that what we pay for is not well aligned with the way that health care should be delivered and the way that we should be thinking about personalized health care in the future. Uh, if you think about the sources of inefficiency in healthcare systems today, uh, no question, uh, inefficient use of new and costly drugs are uh, contributing to that, but the vast majority of inefficient spending is on existing technologies that are not being used effectively, or on new technologies that are being used in marginal or inappropriate indications too much and too little in areas where they could really increase value. And the payment reforms are intended to address this. Uh, uh, they basically aim to give healthcare providers working with their patient populations more flexibility in how they use resources. You don't have to keep uh, the, uh, uh, you don't have to use the specific services that have traditionally been paid for. Uh, you can spend money on things like uh, remote monitoring, telemedicine, non-medical approaches to uh, delivering care, things that may matter more for particular patients. Patients, but they do come with some new kinds of accountability uh, around getting better results. Uh, and around uh, overall cost. Uh, uh, basic idea is more flexibility with more accountability to try to get the, the same or better outcomes for, for, for less resources, which sounds to me very much aligned uh, with the goals that, uh, that cost effectiveness analysis is uh, intended to inform. So uh, this is an effort that I think has been uh, bipartisan, is reflected in legislation like the physician payment reform legislation, MACRA. Uh, I think you're going to see some different flavors of payment reform emerge in the next few years under the new administration and, and Republican leadership. Uh, but regardless, uh, the providers, the patients treated by them, uh, 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 the, uh, the teams and organizations that the providers are part of are going to have increasing opportunities to redirect resources in ways that could get better outcomes uh, and could do it in ways that uh, haven't been part of traditional approaches to delivering care. The the problem is, uh, this is really hard to do. Many of the organizations that are implementing uh, these kinds of payment reforms now are struggling, especially at the beginning. They tend to get better over time, uh, but uh, uh, it is difficult to identify what exactly to change for which particular patients. Even quantitative, qualitative guidance from uh, a CEA framework could be helpful in guiding these efforts and could provide added momentum for applying the tools now increasingly well understood tools of cost effectiveness analysis, driving better data and evidence collection. It's great to have this framework. Uh, it's great to have uh, the, uh, uh, the impact inventory, because even if you can't fill it out well completely today, it lets you know where the gaps are. It lets you know what uh, organizations should be focusing on when they're trying to improve care for their patients. It helps patient advocates focus on what they would like to see developed through uh, NIH research or in the development of new drugs or in studies of drugs once they are on the market. Uh, so especially as we are entering an era of increasingly uh, precise medicine that can draw on an increasingly broad range of treatments and services, familiarizing providers and their patients with the key principles of cost effectiveness analysis could help these reform efforts succeed, could encourage expansion of efforts to develop evidence needed for more complete cost effectiveness analysis. Uh, without the cost effectiveness analyses needing to be literally accurate or complete for each individual patient. I see this as a step beyond the, the so-called 
evidence-based guidelines, which are not based on nearly as much evidence as they should be, towards an emphasis on practical decision tools for patient-focused pathways as we get back to this alignment, not a, not a, uh, a payer perspective that's fundamentally different from a patient perspective, from a, but from a provider perspective, but back to alignment uh, with the goal of getting the best outcomes for our population of patients at the lowest overall cost. Uh, thank you all very much for the opportunity to talk to you this afternoon, and thank you especially for the work on this uh, of the cost effectiveness in health and medicine panel. Thanks. Okay, well, thank you to the panels, and we now open this up for discussion. Um, we have the two microphones here. Yeah. Go ahead, and again, uh, yeah. use the microphone and introduce yourself. Sure, sure. Yeah. I'm Dick Welke, I'm a Dispor, and I like to thank the discussants and, of course, the panel for all the contributions and for laying out some of the problems yet to be solved. And I think the, the book has, you know, I went through and marked some pages where I thought, oh, interesting. Um, has laid out not only what should be done, but a good research agenda. And I got wind from somebody that you've actually thought about that, because there are some things you've introduced that are based on some work, of course, but would stimulate laid a lot more. And I'd like to, one I'd like to call out is the productivity piece, because that's big sometimes. And as soon as you make something big, people are going to want to dig into it and do it better. And that's labor force behavior. And, is such a big issue and anyway so I'd like to maybe hear a little bit more from your thinking or I don't know Peter or the rest is to is there a research agenda attached to this yeah I mean and so uh, I could start there so we actually originally had planned to have a chapter of kind of future research needs or gaps and, and where things need to go and, and really in the end we, we we lost the ability to get everything done in, in the time and the resources. And so that is something that we are very interested in, and, and we will be working on um, that as, as, a, as a separate product um, and trying to provide some guidance from the panel in terms of where we think the research needs to go. Um, but, I, but I think that, you know, that will also pull from some of the ideas that we came, heard from today as well and from the other panelists. I don't know if Peter, Peter right now is leading that effort. Yeah. Yeah. I don't have a lot to add. I, I will say th the plan was to have a final concluding chapter on future directions and for various reasons, mostly uh, r running out of time and resources to finish the book, um, we decided to make it a separate uh, journal article. So we're actually hard at work on that and this day will help us a lot in thinking about it. But productivity and uh, spillovers and thresholds and on and on will be part of that effort. But I mean, obviously, one of the things that um, we love is that not only to have uh, a paper such as this that identifies a lot of those areas, but you know, to have within our field, then people actually do the needed work to actually work on those areas. And so that would be the hope: is that not only would we be identifying them, but then providing some impetus to actually get those looked at and, and researched. Yeah. Norm. Yeah, um, I wonder, and this is addressed to the whole of the panel, whether there is uh, any connection between the lack of uptake in the U.S. in with regard to uh, cost effectiveness analysis and the uh, problem uh, that I think Milt was touching on and uh, Martha was also addressing in part uh, about uh, the identified versus statistical lives problem. Um, so a lot of our interest in health and health care is focused on uh, our, uh, the fact that we identify uh, ourselves and, as being sick. Uh, but we don't see that uh, we are at risk of having the, this or that condition. And that's what a lot of the cost effectiveness analysis is focused on. So I wonder whether there is any uh, way to find a, uh, or to use the fact that uh, there is a focus on identified lives um, in improving the uh, uptake of C CEA. Does anyone want to tackle that? <clears throat> 
Yeah, there. Is that on? Yeah. Um, you know, it's the uh, it's the little girl down the well phenomena that I think is very hard to uh, move people past. I, you know, I think often people make the comment that things go through Congress because people come and tell terrible stories there, and um, we've had a hard time getting our minds around populations, and I'm not sure if that's. Uh, if human t nature will change with the uh, with the appropriate amount of kind of education. I think there's also an element of um, the very different uh, structure and um, payment uh, centralization, if you will, uh, with a decision making body that is uh, perhaps, uh, let's say, in the UK or even in uh, some of the Western European countries that. Uh, have uh, a better control over the, a wider range of uh, decisions uh, with respect to payment and reimbursement, uh, it's a, a little easier to use the tool. Uh, on the other hand, when we have such highly decentralized uh, decision-making capacities as well as a fundamental uh, aversion uh, to um, thinking of people in terms of statistics, uh, the compound effect uh, is a disincentive. I'll try to be quick, uh, Lou Garrison. Uh, Milt, Milt's comment about uh, the health the healthcare sector perspective not being a payer perspective um, made me realize I'm probably misinterpreting things. So, but let me say first about the societal perspective. But it, I guess this is a di and I don't remember if you wrote about this in the volume. This is a different societal perspective than the previous one. When I used to teach the previous one, I would say there were three characteristics. They use community preferences. You consider indirect time costs, which is a thing most people did. And you should actually use the real social opportunity cost of resources, which no one has ever done for anything that we do. Okay, we always use market prices and argue that that's good. So, so we ended up saying in year, years ago that we really do a limited one. Well, that's different. When I look at that, at the current reference case, I would call that a general equilibrium model of a health intervention. You're going to drop this into the healthcare system and look at the way. So it's a totally different thing than uh, the, the previous societal perspective, which was just focusing on those three things. That's an observation. So then the question is, well, what is this healthcare sector perspective? When I read it, it's got the same things in there that NICE looks at. I'm going to look at qualities. I'm going to look at utility. I'm going to look at costs. Okay. So to me, I sort of say, well, that's that's really kind of a payer perspective. And so when I talked about it, when I was speaking about health technology assessment, that's what that's the usual kind of setup for most of our, our analyses, public payers, private payers, what in a normative way, if they were trying to be good agents for the, the payers were the agent of their subscribers, here's what they should put in the plan. And that's, so that to me, that healthcare sector perspective, it looks like a payer perspective, is it not? And I don't know, Milt, maybe you're looking at it differently. Yes, it's close okay. to it in the UK, in Britain, but it's not in the US. There, I mean, it was mentioned before. If you're a member of a private health plan while you're working, and then you're going to go on Medicare, and you're going to leave that plan, then the plan that you're on now doesn't care if they're going to save money when you don't develop osteoporosis and have a hip fracture when you're 85. Okay, okay. I, I, okay. well, That's I mean. That's the distinction well, I mean, there, okay. well, so if the purpose of the healthcare perspective is to okay. make it make the cost effectiveness analysis yeah. real for a, a, an actual decision maker, 
It okay. might work for the National Health Service in Britain, but it's not going to work in the U.S. for So you you're know, making a positive United economic healthcare. claim that we, because we're a fragmented healthcare system, yes. it's a poor approximation. That's the That's point. That's a different I'm argument making. than a normative argument about if the, if your private payer, if the VA had you forever, yeah. then they right. should worry about well, your gonna, lifetime you cost. Can, then they would be you like know, that. You can argue how good or bad an approximation yeah. is, okay. but the point is that there are some important discrepancies between the yeah. two. Okay, so so, it has to do with the fragmentation of the U.S. health It has system. to do with the fragmentation yeah. and even the churn within the private uh, health sector. Thank you. That's good. Yeah. Okay, great. So um, we're going to have one last question for David. Great. Yeah. So that, that was the perfect segue for my question, which is I'm going to target at Mark. So Milt, Milt's comments and discussion has highlighted that we do have a fragmented health care system and we can have a discrepancy between a societal perspective, a health care sector perspective, and then the perspective of an individual payer. And if there's one thing we know in the United States is that when you do an analysis that threatens someone's approach to things or calls it into question, there's a lot of pushback about it. And few things, if anything, are more politicized right now than health care. And so do you have some insights from your extensive experience in government about how to bring analytic tools to bear to really shed light on this issue and turn it into a productive discussion rather than finger pointing about whether people are not not doing the right things? Yeah, I remember the uh, short answer. <laughs> 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 and we're going to get some chances to see it. In the, in the coming months, as we take a, as a country takes a new look, and Congress and the administration take a, a certainly different direction on uh, coverage issues, and, and how do you deal with things like uh, uh, patient shifting to the plan, and also encouraging uh, things to the fight? Uh, I, I think these tools are actually quite helpful in that regard uh, uh, for highlighting the importance of taking account of long term, longer term uh, uh, benefits and costs. Uh, this has uh, probably some. Practical consequences and how people are thinking about issues like risk adjustment and, uh, and dealing with higher risk patients uh, and uh, the coming year of health reform. I don't think those are at all settled uh, issues. Um, and it also has to do with, um, again, I think we're going back to applying this framework to practical uh, policy questions. Um, the, a lot of the report, understandably, focused on many different dimensions uh, of cost. I mean, as Mark has said, um, there, there's a lot to be said, a lot more to be done on the benefit side as well for patients where medical intervention really do make a difference, not just today, but not just next year, but maybe five years down the road. Having some clear frameworks uh, for how to think about that uh, is a foundation for, for, for having an impact. So um, uh, we have a lot of controversy about these issues because um, it's, it's, it's really the front lines for what the role of government should be versus uh, the, the role of localities and, and especially individuals, uh, but uh, just because we have those philosophical differences, it doesn't mean that they can't be guided by solid analysis <laughs> like uh, this, this cost effective work. So, you know, Kelly is still a, a little bit of an optimist uh, despite uh, what are going to be some, some controversies and, and uh, tough times on uh, on, on, on the road on, on health care reform ahead. Um, it, uh, the more they can be informed by solid analysis and a clear framework, like you know, Okay. Well, I want to thank our panelists. I know I'm going to let Milton and Martha run off. Um, but thank you. And uh, I think Ted just has a, a few departing words before we adjourn. Few departing words will not take long. I do have two comments from the last session. First of all, thank you. Second of all, Martha, it's not in the impact inventory, but the ethical concerns are in the reporting uh, guidelines, so at least it's there. And I'm married to a Brit, and I'll tell you, they is different. Um, they don't expect a mammogram at age 40. They don't expect to get a PSA. So everything that was just said now, I think, is true in terms of how the healthcare system can change, but also society is demanding, is pushing uh, health care here that's different in some other countries, and that's another area that we can work on. <clears throat> now my brief concluding remarks, you know, 20 years ago, everybody was here, not everybody, but there, people were here um, thanking Michael and saying great things about the panel, and they said they were hoping to get a new book out in maybe 10 years. 
Over five and a half years ago, we started this process. It was a two-year process over five and a half years ago. And um, so anybody who's planning on coming back in the 20 years, they were just saying, I would start, uh, I would start that a little sooner than you might think. Um, I want to say thank you because it was great having this meeting because after, as you heard, the leadership group talked for hundreds and hundreds of hours. We had panel meetings that went on for days and days, and it's the first time Louise and I have been in the same room which is also a commendation on how well technology can work today. But in terms of thanks, obviously we want to thank the first panel, um, everybody on the first panel. Many of them participated in the writing of this book, but two of them in particular, Louise Russell and Joanna Siegel, were so invested that they actually participated the second time too and that's just absolutely remarkable. The panel obviously we said it had to be a fairly high bar for us to change anything in the in the original panel to the second panel because we didn't want to just have a whole bunch of changes. Well we made a fair number of changes. In my opinion we made a lot of advances in the practice and in the theory and now we have from our own thoughts and from today future work that needs to be done to be able to advance the practice and the theory, and that's all very excited. For today, of course, we want to thank um, Beverly and Jordan and, uh, oh my gosh, the last one? Julie, yes, yeah, the people who've been running around making sure that everything's working, the sound and AV people from the IOM, they're doing a great job. Amazing presenters, I've just been stimulated today, didn't fall asleep once. <laughs> <coughs> The people on the web, thank you, and thank you for your participation. The people here, your, your questions and all helped make the day incredibly great. And then just on a personal note, I want to th once again thank all of the current panel members in the leadership group with Peter and Julian and Louise and, of course, uh, uh, Joanna. Uh, this has been an amazing process and a, at the end of a wonderful day. Thank you all for showing up. <clears throat>